our values statement comes out of these three purpose statements and really this first introduction to the purpose statement. Crossroads exists to bring the truth of God's word. God's word is the, is the key in all of this that we've been talking about. To the crossroads of Tracy through passionate, God-centered worship, through creative, others-focused outreach, and through dynamic, <coughs> servant-producing discipleship. As we've talked through our, our values, we've hit the word of God. We've hit worship. We talked about last week. Well, let me go. Let me do it this way. Uh, we, we talked about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Scripture. Remember those two words. I, I want you to. I want you to know those two words by heart. That we believe that the Scripture is supreme in in, in its authority in our lives. That it is sufficient for all life and godliness. We also talked about that we value integrated, multicultural, multi-generational, participatory, corporate worship. That's a mouthful. I, I really don't care if you remember all the words. I want you to remember the concepts. It's important to us as a church that we, we are welcoming to people of all kinds of of backgrounds and all kinds of abilities and disabilities. Amen? That we are welcoming to various kinds of cultures. My children are so good to me. I'm having throat issues and the water just isn't coming out, so something hot well. <laughs> Only I think it's too hot. Ooh. Sorry. <clears throat> Multi-generational. Everything from, he turned 89 this week. If you haven't had a chance to wish Pastor Shemp a happy birthday, well, Wednesday was his birthday. 89 years young. Well, maybe not. Anyway, uh, wish him happy. Down to our youngest back there, Mark is, how old is Mark now? Five months. Five months. Oh, how'd that happen? Really? Participatory. You're part of worship. We worship together. It, it's interactive. It's you, you. You sing and you give and you listen and you. We we do this together. And even times you answer questions or Benny make, tells us what somebody said on Facebook. That's great. Praise God. Corporate means we do this together. We do this as a church. Last week we talked about the sanctity of all human life. And isn't it interesting that New York passed this horrible bill on, in, during the Sanctity of Human Life Month and on the same, around the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday? I pray that someday our country as a whole will stand for life. From birth? No. From conception. You know, at, at this moment, I will I would be glad to see a bill, a, a, a national bill like they passed in Iowa. The heartbeat bill. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would I would be that would make me rejoice, amen? It would it would eliminate ninety percent of abortion or more. But also to natural death. All life is precious. Death is precious. Natural death, God taking a saint home to the Lord to, to be with him is precious. Don't, don't ever forget that. But we should never be the cause either of our own death or of somebody else's death because that's God's business. Life is precious. <clears throat> now, we're going to go on to this, this, this purpose statement of outreach, and we're going to talk about being a missional. That comes from the word missionary. Missional, reproductive church. 
missional has the idea of every believer sent. And it's the idea of our church reproducing other churches. But not all the churches that we would reproduce would be just like us. Some might be larger, some might be smaller. Missional is, has to do with the individuals in the church. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Reproductive has to do with the mindset of the church as a corporate body. Our mindset is that we desire to see baby churches planted. This morning, right now, Cross Point Church of Tracy is having their first official worship service at the Starlight Studios. That's what we used to call MIT. That we, for almost three years, supported the birthing process of. Why on earth would we put time and energy into helping another church get started? Because we, are, are, we have the value of being a reproductive church. And so we're helping... Another church, Cross Point in Milpitas, with the process of establishing a new church here in Tracy to reach the Chinese community, both in Mandarin and Cantonese. And they're having two services this morning. The first service in, I believe the first service is Mandarin, and the second service is Cantonese and interpreted to English. Have I got that right? Praise God. I'm going to be gone one of these Sundays, and somebody else is going to speak here because I'm going to be over there preaching. Because Andrews has invited me. Isn't that neat? And Andrews is going to come back over here sometime. We'll see. So the idea of missional has the idea of every believer being sent. In the Bible, we see that the Father sent the Son. And the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit sent the church. Jesus said, even as the Father sent me, so send I you. I, I, I don't know. I shouldn't do this. There's a song, an old church hymn, <clears throat> so it's called So Send I You. Do you know it? The original was terrible. So send I you to labor unrewarded. I mean, the lady that wrote it, wrote it in a very, very, very difficult time in her ministry, in her missionary ministry. She was a missionary in one country. And things were not going well. And she wrote this poem for herself. Somebody got a hold of it and published it. And it got into the hymn books. And everybody, this is a great spiritual hymn. It's terrible. She regretted it for years until she finally wrote a second hymn called So Send I You by Grace Made Strong. John W. Peterson wrote the music for it. It's, a, it's got a great tune. Hello. Uh, Benny, are you doing that? Sorry. You can't, you can't lean on the keyboard there, buddy. Missional Church. Every believer needs to carry out the work of a missionary. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Mission centers has to do with the idea of declaring the good news to a dying world. Too many churches today are so focused on what's happening inside the church, on programs, and on Keeping going on the on the facility. I tell you what. Sometimes I am thankful we don't have that we lease and we don't own. Because when you get bogged down in facility problems, it can ruin your focus as a missional church. And things things become centered on keeping the building in good repair, which you need to do instead of focused on the mission of the church. 
which we put in our purpose statement as being creative other stones. It's an external approach to outreach and evangelism. I want to I want to read this. This was by Bernie Osberger. Bernie Osberger is the pastor in Iowa. He, he and his dad, not Bernie, this is Bryce, Bryce, Bryce Osberger. Uh, his dad has been a, um, I like to say it this way, a mover and shaker in our association for a lot of years. Uh, been on the Council of 18. If you don't know what that is, I'll educate you later. Uh, it's just our the governing group, a gro governing group of men that keeps the association going. And by the way, our association uh, was once described as um, cords of strands of sand as strong as iron. In other words, it's an association, a, vo a voluntary association of churches where the association can tell the churches nothing, but the churches can tell the association everything. There's no authority. They can't dictate to us who your pastor is going to be, who, what organizations you're going to be a part of, etc. Other than saying, if you do these things, we can't be associated with you. That's all they can do. But as part of the association, we have a voice in where the association goes and what the association does. That's a good thing. Amen? So, Bernie Osberger, his son, Brian, wrote this. Rather than trying to attract unbelievers to attend church, the primary work of evangelism takes place outside the walls of the church building. In the early years of this couple's ministry, church was something that society compelled you to go to. You were a unusual person if you didn't go to church somewhere. And so to invite somebody to come in and check out our church was natural and normal. Today, you are the unusual ones that come to church, at least on a regular basis. Very, mo most people would say there is no compel compelling of society to attend church, to worship God. In fact, even within the church, large, large idea church, Many people would say, you know, well, you don't really have to go and, and go to church. And, and I'm glad we have the Facebook Live for those that can't be here. But I don't want it to ever be an excuse for somebody that can be here. You, we believe in corporate worship. That's the idea of coming together. Uh, I, Linda, Linda, I'm glad you're here this morning this way because you can be. And anybody else that's watching. But if you're, if you're able-bodied and able to come, you should be here. We talked about that. Where was I going with that? I got off track. <laughs> but society doesn't compel people to come in today. In fact, if anything, society is, is keeping us out. And even the church is saying, well, you know, you can worship anywhere. You can worship anywhere. But you cannot participate in corporate, participatory, multicultural, multi, multi-generational, integrated worship anywhere except together in a church service. And if we value that, and I think I made a case for that a couple of weeks ago, that means you come in. However, the world doesn't value that. And a lot of people don't. So our approach to evangelism has to be outside these walls. And if all we ever do is hear, <coughs> come in, come, come, come visit, come visit, come visit, we've got a very wrong focus. <clears throat> the first word up there on that purpose statement is creative. We are needing to become more and more creative in how we reach people for Christ. I almost <coughs> want to add a word, and that's bold. We need boldness outside the walls. Too often we become timid and we need to be bold. It also, um, being missional, and Osberger was saying that it gives us these uh, benefits, being mission-centered, declaring the good news to a dying world, 
uh, having that external approach, uh, an effort to reach people who may not attend church. We need to reach out to people who are less likely to visit, to ever visit uh, the church. Our culture is increasingly pagan. People are not inclined to walk through the doors of the church. Being missional challenges us to reach out to all of our neighbors. Go and be versus come and see. The idea is to be, and, and this word is used a lot in the missional movement, be incarnate. In other words, put the Bible and Jesus in the flesh, and you're that incarnation, if you will. I don't want to, I don't want to minimize Christ's incarnation because he's God in the flesh, amen? But you're the message, you're the gospel in the flesh. And that's what that's talking about. The God being the gospel in the flesh. It also causes us to have a careful evaluation of our existing programs and events. The church in the U.S. today is becoming too ingrown, consumed with building, etc. Missional has to do with our mindset. Each one of us understanding that each one of us is a missionary that is commanded to go and see. I always forget, and I, I guess I need my sound man to help me out so once in a while when I forget. A reproductive church seeks opportunities to divide and establish new churches. Every living entity reproduces. <coughs> In preparation for last week, I watched a number of videos on the conception and, and development of uh, infant in the womb. That first few moments after uh, the egg of the woman has been fertilized is amazing. Because almost as soon as the DNA comes together as this new life, <coughs> it reproduces. One cell becomes quickly two. Two cells quickly become four, and four become eight. And, and it's absolutely astonishing how quickly that happens. And to think that in nine months, that one cell, once well, Letha's case, becomes a five pounds eleven, five pound eleven ounce baby. It wasn't quite nine months, it was eight months. If you don't know that story, I'm not telling it this morning. Ask me something. So. Still, amazing, isn't it? That that reproduction, that instinct, and the DNA is exactly replicated. And that's what we're wanting to do: is to to replicate churches that think in the same way, that are missional reproductive churches that hold the same doctrine. That doesn't mean they're going to do things exactly the same way we do it. Praise God. We need some variety in the world. Amen? But we do want them to hold to these values and these purposes as we think about down the road, what is Crossroads going to do in the idea of reproducing itself? I would love to see us establish something we're going to be on this side of town, establish something over by Mountain House down the road. Grow and divide. I think it would be absolutely fantastic. <clears throat> That's what I just talked about. A reproductive church is sent out into the <coughs> harvest field to grow and learn. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10, if you have your Bibles. <laughs> Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others, and he sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and every place where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is abundant, 
But the workers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, travel bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whoever's house shall enter first. Enter first, say peace to this house, and if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, and so forth. <clears throat> Jesus took these the disciples and these seventy, and he divided them two by two and sent them out. That's what we're talking about in the idea of missional. They went out representing Christ. And he told them, don't take anything with you. Why? Because everything was going to be provided by God. You see, we're sent out into the harvest, and we need to learn to trust God. When we fear, when we're timid, when we lack boldness, Part of that is a lack of trust of God. We need to trust not only that our words would be received and whether or not received, it's okay. Kick the dust off the sandals and move on. That's what he talks about. Where it is received, the, the fields are white to harvest. Jesus said the very same thing in the book of John with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman had gone into town. She was coming back out with all these men of the town. And he said to his disciples, look, look at the field. Now, it was three months to harvest this grain. He says, look at the field. It's white to harvest. And they're going, what are you talking about? This grain isn't ready. But he was looking at the people coming and saying, they're ready to listen. They're ripe to harvest. Good soil evangelism. Nana's brother, Gil Thomas, is a mover and shaker in Good Soil Evangelism. Good Soil Evangelism talks about what things mean right for harvest and where people are at on the ladder and how to get them to a point, how to cultivate good soil. If you've never been through studying how to use good soil, we would love to take you through that. God Shade would love to take you through that. We have the books. It's a way you can bring in friends and neighbors and tell them the story of God's redemptive plan. Hey, I'd like to share with you what I believe and why. Let me tell you about what the Bible says. The fields are white to harvest. The problem is sometimes we spend too much time trying to harvest unripe wheat. And we don't go looking for the ripe ones. And when we get discouraged because we're too involved in trying to find which ones, to trying to say, hey, here's a, here's a stock of wheat, I want to harvest it, but it won't, it won't harvest because it's not ripe yet. We, we stay there. We get stuck or we stop trying. Jesus said, go out into the harvest. Be bold. Don't take anything with you. I'm going to provide it. I want you to trust me. Don't take a, a, a money bag. Don't take sandals, etc." Drop your eyes down to verse 17. The 70 returned with, the, with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. <laughs> they came back excited. They had learned to trust. Jesus said, hey, don't rejoice, verse 20, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yeah. This is what it's about. Rejoice that you have salvation. And, my friends, when somebody gets saved, rejoice that their name is written in heaven. Amen? That's what it's about. That's about missional thinking. Missional thinking is, I stand up at Highland Baptist Church. You, some of you have been there. I stand up and I look at the lights of the Bay Area and I weep. Because there's millions going to hell. John's dad, years ago, pastored the Brave Baptist Church in Fremont. In the middle of the Bay Area, in the middle of a, of a difficult place to serve. There needs to be lighthouses in those places. He was a lighthouse. 
Carlos, a lighthouse in the Spanish community in Fremont, California. Haywood, Haywood, California. Close enough. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 <clears throat> kind of talks about this idea. Jesus sent them out two by two. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says two are better than one. As you go out, we're not talking about going out and knocking on doors. That's okay. But we're talking about living your life and doing it as a group. As, as couples, as, as partners, always having somebody there, even if in life, that's there to encourage you. It says if one falls down, if they're alone, where's the one that'll lift him up? One cannot withstand another alone, but two can withstand them. And a threefold cord, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, threefold cord is not easily broken. The idea is when we get wrapped up in each other's lives, we're stronger. And this happens, this, this is true in evangelism. It's true in being missional in your thinking. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to fall down. It's easy to trip up. And we need somebody that's there saying, let's go. We'll go together. We'll do it together to encourage you, to strengthen you. We're sent. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. You've heard this preached on, I have no doubt, many, many times in your life. If you've said in church, you should have heard this passage preached on. <coughs> Jesus, just before he returned to heaven, gave the great commission to the church. And this is not to church corporate, it's to the people of the church. It was to the disciples, and by definition, it moves on to us. He says, make disciples. Well, let's start at verse 18. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Going, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. I said going, and you're, you're saying, Pastor Tim, my translation says go. <clears throat> Makes it sound like go is the imperative. It's not. Go is a gerund. I won't, I won't get into that too much with you. It's an ing word in Greek. It should be going. The command, which is in the aorist active imperative, is make disciples. Make disciples. Arist has the idea of a one-time event. It's not, it's translated past tense, but it's a one-time event. So, I make a disciple, we see a person saved, it doesn't have to happen over and over again. Yeah, no more trips. Good thing I've got good balance. Make disciples is what we're to be doing. That has to do with outreach. That has to do with evangelism. It's reaching people around us. We have to have a mindset of those that are around us need Christ. If they don't know Christ. My greatest concern for my neighbor Linda is Christ. Not her health. My greatest worry is that she'll die without knowing Christ. Linda's going to die one day. I'm going to die one day. We can't prolong that forever. But do we know Christ? Make disciples. It's the job of every believer. It is your job. You're sent. Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so I send I you. To do what? To make disciples. How? Well, there's three ING words. The first one is going. As we are going, assumes that we're out in the world touching people that are not yet disciples. 
Shame on those Christians that isolate themselves from the world, that they're never interacting with unbelievers. Shame on them, because how can they make disciples if they never meet somebody that needs to be a disciple? Amen? I love, I love that we have public school teachers in our, in our church, and a bunch of them. They're at the crossroads, rubbing elbows with students and parents. Being the incarnation of the gospel. I love it that we have truck drivers and guys that work behind a computer and at the jail and everything else. Nurses. I don't know about air traffic controllers. But, you know. <laughs> I'm glad for somebody to keep me safe in the air, Amen. And then he's getting paid again. Praise God. <clears throat> Not a good thing with those guys working in the gym. As we go, it has to do with our everyday walk of life. Who do you rub elbows with that needs Christ? That you have an opportunity to make disciples. And when you've seen somebody come to Christ, made a disciple, what's the first thing that they're to do? Well, the next thing, the next ing word is baptizing. Baptizing them. And they were already a disciple. They're saved. Baptizing doesn't make them a disciple. Baptizing is a matter of obedience and identification. Baptizing them in the singular name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to get into that in detail this morning. And then the third thing, the third ING word is teaching. The process of discipleship starts with salvation, moves through baptism, and then is a continuing effort of teaching. We call that progressive sanctification. It's a process, a lifetime process. Nana, how old were you when you were saved? Are you still on that process? Yes. Just a couple years later. <laughs> Shirley, how old were you when you were saved? Teenager. Teenager. She's now above, she's an octogenarian. <laughs> Almost 70 years, 65 years on the process of being made a disciple and still learning. Of being taught and we are to be the ones teaching <clears throat> he hasn't changed his focus on who he's talking to you're the ones that are to be bringing people to Christ and me too leading people to salvation you're the ones that are leading to them to baptism that's an ordinance of the church but you help them get there and you're the ones that's to be teaching them and discipling them guess what that means you also need to be being taught and discipled uh, Anna, you're a great mathematician. Are you still learning? My niece talked about she was accepted into a doctoral program, I think, two years ago today or something on Facebook. She's still learning. Janae disappeared. She was back there. I think she's, yeah, in she's, in there. In there. she's in a master's program. Now. She's still learning. And even when they're done with all their degrees, you're still learning. What have you learned new this week? Learned some things new this week. Pretty cool. I, I'll share something in in, uh, in Sunday school if I get done here. Teaching them to obey. Obedience is the height of discipleship. Obedience is what a disciple learns to do: to obey everything that Christ taught. Just. Over, well, into the book of Acts, chapter 1, which would just be a few days, a few moments later, really, um, Jesus told his disciples a little more. He, he said, you will, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. 
How do we disciple? How do we make disciples? It starts by being a witness. Now, this is this word doesn't isn't a command. It's in the indicative mode, mood, not mode, but mood. It's it means it, indicative is a statement of fact. So it doesn't say you need to go and witness. It says you are a witness. Picture yourself on a on the witness stand of a trial, and before you are all the people you know. And you're giving testimony with your life. First of all, are you believable? What kind of testimony are you giving? Is it testimony that will bring somebody to Christ or cause them to reject? By the way, you don't control whether or not somebody gets saved. That's the Holy Spirit. Always remember that. You don't save anybody. Amen? Amen. Praise God. You're just to be a witness. You're just to be a witness. Be a witness that shows Christ. Shows the love of Christ. Where? He said, you will be my witnesses in three places. I know. It says four. I, I, I bullied that. Jerusalem and Judea are really very similar in the, in, the, in the region and in concept. My concept for this, if you've heard this before, well, good, you're going to hear it again. But my concept for this, my idea, I started thinking about this. If there are to be witnesses, how, how do the people in these areas receive them? Well, the people in Jerusalem and Judea had the same base background in faith. They were Jews believing the Old Testament, Right? They, they were of similar culture. They all shared the same background. These were people that it was easy for the disciples to talk to and relate to and so forth. And, you know, Alex, he, he, he's a mechanic, machinist guy. He can talk mechanics with anybody. That's his Jerusalem. That's his Jerusalem. Why? Because he, they're on the same page. Right? You understand? It can have, it, it has a lot to do with people that have a faith background. So I see people that are coming from other Christian type faiths, Catholicism, even Mormonism, as having, as being maybe Jerusalem or maybe Samaria. Samaria is, is a people, generally I think of Samaria as a people with a similar background, but there's a built in prejudice. Now, Christians, I hope you don't have prejudice. But they did. The Jews had a prejudice towards against the Samaritans and the Samaritans against the Jews. They did. And I don't care how hard we try. Some Deep down, there's, there's people you just, you know, I don't even want to talk to somebody that's like this. Whatever it is. We have to overcome that. Jesus went to the Samaritan woman. He took his disciples there. They weren't real happy to go into Samaria. You know what? Philip went back to Samaria. And great numbers of people were, of Samaritans were saved. Praise God. There's going to be Samaritans in heaven. Amen? That's so cool. We have to overcome those things that stop us. Whatever they be. Whatever it is that brings us to where I don't want to talk to this person. I don't feel comfortable with this person. We have to overcome that. And then he goes on and says to the uttermost parts of the world. These are people of completely different culture, language, religion. Their background is completely foreign. When Paul went to these people, he started with, with the creator God. Because they had no concept of who God was. Of who Jehovah was. We're called to be witnesses in a dark world. The idea of being missional means that we're reproducing ourselves. And the idea of being reproductive church 
means we're reproducing our church. Two concepts brought into this one idea, this one value statement, all having to do with outreach. If we're going to reach another community near here, maybe we're going to go out and plant a church in Vernalis. I'm not sure why we would do that, but let's just... That's reproduction. Maybe it's, a, it's going to be a small Bible study of because we have some people out there that have been reached and discipled and they want to see a church established in their community. So we've talked about the supremacy of Scripture. Scripture tells us that we're to make disciples. Scripture tells us that we're witnesses. Out of Scripture comes this idea of being a missional reproductive church. We've talked about what our worship should look like. We've talked about the fact that we value human life from conception to natural death. And now we've talked about this idea of who we are as a church, missional, reproductive, that we value the idea of reproduction. That's outreach. We're going to get into discipleship as part of our value statement. We're going to talk about some things that deal with discipleship. But this is... This is reaching other people, reproducing ourselves, reproducing our church. And there, I, I pray that there comes a day when we have so many people coming from a certain area that we're going to split it, split off and start another church. Wouldn't that be awesome? Some of you say, I don't really think that would be so great. Yes, it will. Because we're going to reach more people for Christ. Because what's it about? It's about them knowing Christ. It's about reaching our world. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us the, the charge, the command to go and make disciples, to reproduce ourselves, both individually and as a church. Help us, Father, to be bold, creative, focused on the needs of those around us needing Christ, keeping in the forefront of our mind we look at the masses of people around us, that many of them, if they were to die today, would not be with you. Father, it's our desire to see people come to Christ. Use us. Help us to be your kind of witnesses.